pass to Johnson. Johnson still going. Dummies again. Johnson. Oh, yeah. Into the white of Brown. Oh, Brown goes in to score. Only Salvador down the touchline. Oh, this is a goal. 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 Oh good, we're on another episode of Surly Talk Sports in the mixer, in the new studio and again, got to say thanks to the legends at Ortex and Nomadica for firing up this bad boy. She soundproofed within an inch of its life. The quality pumping out of here is unreal. Plus, we get to put on this display that you can see if you're watching the YouTube. Been able to deck her out, six of the greats on the wall, got the Surly lights and nice couches. It's really just elevated things to me for the next level. It's been my dream space for a while and it wouldn't have been possible without those two companies so again thanks to Ortex and Nomadica for their work in hooking up this beautiful space. Shout out to the TAB and Better Bear as well of course TAB headline sponsor of the podcast. They've been with us for a bloody long time almost since day one. It's the home of sporting and racing punting here in New Zealand so if you are having a flutter this weekend do so responsibly but get around the TAB show them. The surly listeners really appreciate their support and better bear she's the ultimate low carb bear only 87 calories it's always a day for it whenever better bear is in the mixer and a bit of a hint but of course drop the other night surly talk sports golf day she is going down november 16th and of course we need a bear sponsor and if you can pick up what I'm putting down there, then you might have well just worked out who will be taking care of the tins. But on the golf day, tickets go on sale next Sunday, so make sure you're ready. 6pm, set your alarm. She should sell out fast. There's a stack lineup of sponsors who will be there on the day. Some sick prizes will pull together as well. We're going to be doing your usuals. The nearest to the pin, longest drive, a putting comp, a 19th hole shootout as well. It's going to be a four-man Ambrose format, nine hole so short and sharp but start assembling your four get your team together pick out the four best roosters you know or the three best actually including yourself of course and start to fire up there's going to be more details on where to buy tickets released soon but this is an event you don't want to miss the first edition of the annual TAB Surly Talk Sports Golf Day presented by the Roos at Grip and Rip it's going to be an absolute doozy bears and bogeys strap yourself in party hole as well it's going to be all go. The golf is almost secondary. Doesn't matter if you suck. As long as there's someone within your four, you're going to have yourself a heck of a day either way. In terms of this week's pod though, plenty of sport to tuck into. Now the admin is out of the way. The Penrith Panthers for Pete. Got to tick the boxes there. Review that game as well as of course your international squad's name for the Pacific Championship. Speaking of international squads, All Blacks, All Blacks 15. Lot to pick through from those two teams. NPC finals time. The Ramfilly Shield on the road again and landing in Taranaki for this summer. We've got the weekly wrap and the ever-popular Q&A. Didn't forget it this time. That's in the mixer as well as your punting. So without further ado, let's kick her off and get into it. How bloody good. Rugby League, and of course, the big dance she's done and dusted. Your Penrith Panthers get the chocolates yet again. But before we tuck into that game and cover off all the big talking points from Sunday night's spectacle, a fair bit of news to cover from around the traps too. Of course, your teams have been named, your squads for the Pacific Championship coming up. Can't wait for this contest. Love myself some international footy, and while it's been tarnished due to so many injuries, players having to pull pin, I'm still really looking forward to these contests, and I'll be down in Christchurch for that Kiwis Kangaroos game as well with Lee and Tammy from George FM. So keen to rip into that one. Let's touch on your Kiwis squad first. Of course, Stacey Jones, first year at the helm. And shit, do I feel a little bit sorry for him as well. Not only is he taking over the team off the back of a 30 nil campaign, which many people would say is a massive positive. With that does come some expectation as well. Then you throw into that the fact he's down on troops due to injuries and suspension. At the same time, 
time though, given the circumstances, I think he's still pulled together a bloody good squad. Unavailable due to injury or suspension, listen to some of these names. Dylan Brown, Britton Nicola, Ronaldo Molotalo, Brandon Smith, Jeremy Marshall King, Kieran Foran, Nelson Osofa Solomona, Sean Johnson, Moses Leota, Tamaire Martin, Kale Iro and Joey Manu. There's probably more I've missed off from that list as well, but that right there is pretty much the majority of the core nucleus from the team last year. Our forward pack in particular this year, still really strong, but it's fair to say in the halves and in the centres, Stacey, he's had to dig deep and scout out a couple fringes that probably normally wouldn't get a look in to where the Kiwi on their left tit. I have been playing around with a bit of a team though that I think we could roll out for that first game against the Roos and I've got to say she still looks decent regardless of all those outs. At fullback I Keanu Keeney on the wings William Warbrick, the triple international and Jermaine Aizako in the centres Matty Tomoko and Chance Nicol Klukstad. Of course you could play Chance at six as well which is another great option in the halves Cody's the old eight percenter and Jerome Hughes. That would be a double headgear combination which streams absolute chaos for the Ruse. At hooker Wellington Phoenix Crosland. Great to see him pledge allegiance to our great country and he is going to play an extremely important role without Brandon Smith, without Jeremy Marshall King. He could be in for some big minutes through the middle. Your props James Fisher-Harris and Leo Thompson would love to see them partner at the Waz in a few years time but really excited to see those two ripping together. Really unfortunate about Moses Liotta. Would love to see the Bash brothers out there yet again but hey it is what it is and in a positive of Fisher-Harris moving on from the Panthers. I think every time those two reunite Leota and the Fish in that Kiwis jersey it's just going to mean even more to them. In the second row I went with Sorensen and Papali'i and then at lock Joseph Tapane which left me with a bench of Aaron Clark Gryffindor Neem, Marata Neil Kore and either Jordan Ricky or Nafahu White which isn't bad at all. There is eight potential debutants in that team which is exciting as well. Brings a bit of a fresh energy and I'm really keen to see how the likes of your Keanu Kenny your William Warbrick, these young lads who have really made huge inroads in their NRL careers this year. I'm keen to see how they go at the highest level of the game. I think it is going to be a great watch and that forward pack is still definitely not one to mess around with. Your Kangaroos squad, they've been hit with injuries and depletions as well but she is still pretty strong on paper. Great to see Mana Mitch from across the ditch. Of course our Warriors interim skipper as soon as Tohu dropped out he took over the armband and this is massive reward for him. Dallium awards night robbery but Mel, he knows a quality footballer when he sees him and it's going to be bloody interesting to be rooting against him for once. I love the Blues, I love the Waz, so Mitch has always been playing for my team. This time though, I'm going to wish him well but of course hope that we absolutely do a number on him. I cracked up as well when Chan said he flicked him a message, said congrats bro and Barney in typical Barnett fashion just shot one back saying I'm not your bro. A bit of a rival there hopefully would love to see those two come across each other at some stage but Fisher Harris up against Barnett a nice little preview as to what we can expect to see at the Warriors next year which is bloody exciting times some big outs some big omissions that Mel decided to leave out of his squad DCE he doesn't get picked which is pretty crazy and that probably signals the end of him in the green and gold jersey instead Mal opted to go with Mitchie Moses despite not having played a game of footy since Origin 3 so expect a bit of rust around Mitch but clearly he thinks that he can get the job done. Got a massive boot and shit did he turn it on that night at Suncorp Stadium but it's not easy to come in off such a long layoff and just get straight into your work at a bloody high level. James Tedesco unfortunately he missed as well. Pretty crazy scene second in the Dally M but just couldn't get picked in this squad and then Kalen Ponga after all those backflips, Mel Meninga just decided, nah, you're not in my squad anyway, clearly you didn't want to be, and it almost is a little bit low-key embarrassing really, you say you're not available, then you come out under pressure and say you're available and you don't get picked, to me, that's a little bit of an up yours right there, but hey, it is what it is, interesting fact, it's the first time both State of Origin captains haven't made a kangaroo side since 2003, of course no DCE and no Jake Travojevic for this one either, but still, this squad has plenty of 
of potential on paper. Still some of the biggest names in the game, some superstars. Edwards, Travojevic and co. This is going to be a bloody hard team to beat in the Roos. You best believe they'll be stinging off the back of last year, looking to put some pride back in that green and gold classic jersey, which is a pretty dusty kit, if I may say so myself. And then Tonga, they rolled out probably the most stacked of the sides for this competition. And it does bring up the question as to whether them and Samoa should still be classified as Tier 1. The fact that Samoa were in the final of the last World Cup and it does seem weird that guys like Luai can literally play for the Māori All-Stars, New South Wales and either Samoa or Australia all in the one year if he wanted to. I love having the Island Nations strong. I think it's great for the game. Adds another element of competition for so long. It was just us Kangaroos, Great Britain, that were the three good sides. You chuck in Samoa, Tonga and Fiji now and that makes it way more competitive. So don't get me wrong, I'm a big believer in it. But at the same time, Tonga and Samoa in particular... When you look at these squads, they're so stacked and the appeal of being able to play Origin and then for your Island Nation is massive and I think this Tonga team is a testament to that. Great to see Roger lacing up for Samoa to a Samoan side that is depleted on players due to old critter getting married in the off-season, no Bizza, no Luai for them, but Tonga stacked. Massive forward pack and then Razzle Galore in the back line. They're going to be up for this one. They're going to prove bloody hard to beat. And that game against the Kiwis at the Fortress, the home of Rugby League, Go Media Stadium, Mount Smart. That is going to be one you don't want to miss. The Tongan flags are going to be out in massive numbers. And the atmosphere is going to be bloody unreal. Moving away from the international game, back to your NRL news. Panthers, they've pulled pin on the World Club Challenge. They've come out and said that it's all a bit hard for them when you factor in that they're going to Vegas for round zero as well. It's a long season as it is, too much travel, and they've said, sorry, we're not going to play in this game. You do wonder if long term, this signals a bit of the beginning of the end for this type of game too. The NRL season, she's bloody long enough and gruelling enough as it is. There's already players coming out like Chance recently saying, shorten the NRL season so we can have a bigger international test window. I'm a huge advocate for that. You throw in a World Club Challenge game at the start of the year too and the fact that it probably doesn't mean as much as other games do now. Yes, the rivalry is still there in a way and you want to be crowned the best team in the world but at the same time, I don't think there's a genuine argument that the Panthers wouldn't go over to the Super League and pump their best if it meant a shit ton to them and if it wasn't in their preseason as well. So I do think the World Club Challenge is a massive danger now of dropping off the calendar. Panthers, they've said, let's focus on round zero and bloody fair enough to them as well. Regan Campbell-Gillard, he's been signed to the Gold Coast Titans and a massive get for Des Hasler and those lads. He forms a pretty formidable forward pack now when you think... The likes of Tino Fasor, Malawi will be back from that ACL injury. Big David Fafida, Big Mo Fotuwaka, Bo Furmore. There's some big names there now. And the Titans, I thought they played some pretty decent football this year. They lack consistency at times, which really did hurt them, particularly in the back end. But if you can add a meter eater, a genuine nut trucker, and a bit of an enforcer like RCG, I think he won Parramatta's Player of the Year, and they let him go. It just shows how much of a shambles that club is at the moment but a great get for them bring some experience as well some leadership value which will be massive for the lads from the GC and then finally the NRL it's come out that they've rejected the Western Bears as their 18th team which I thought was almost dead and signed. I thought it was locked in that a team would be playing in Perth next year. Each year the NRL, they take a game there, gets massive crowds, always bums on seats. So I thought they'd prove there was an appetite to have a team in that market. The Bears, God bless them, they've been trying their dicks off every single year, mixing up their bids, desperate to get back into the competition. But still, they couldn't get the job done. And surely this means to me that the PNG side is now more likely and they are going to get the green light. I think this is a strictly business decision and there's a bit of politics involved as well. I think the Aussie government or something is going to prop it up. Not quite 100% sure. I'm sure a few of you listening know the real deal and do your own research there. Not sure how it's going to work competitiveness-wise as well. They'll have to be based in Australia, but are they going to be able to attract some big name players in order to be competitive in this competition or are the NRL just setting them up to win the wooden spoon and going money over competitiveness? I'm not quite sure, but hey, the NRL is a business. 
Clearly they've gone down that route or they look to be heading down that route. So stay tuned for more news on that. But on to last week's game. Of course, the game's biggest stage and the Panthers, they got it done in convincing fashion for me to 14 points to 6. They win four premierships on the trot. The first team to do so since the Dragons went 11 on the bounce back in the 50s and 60s. The first team to achieve the four P in the salary cap era. You add to that five straight grand final appearances and this is pretty hectic and I still see people out there saying they are not the best team in history because the drags like I said 11 titles straight that is incredibly impressive but when you factor in A like I just mentioned there was no salary cap there and B the game was completely different there was literally no tackle limit it was unlimited tackles until you made an error so for me that puts a line through that and I think the Panthers are the greatest team that we have ever seen in NRL history just to make two grand finals straight is incredibly impressive. The salary cap is literally designed in order to stop teams from doing this. The fact that each year they lose star players, big names, not just your fringes, guys like Kikau, Burden, Api Kodasau, Stephen Crichton, and literally everyone comes out and says, I don't think the Panthers are going to be able to recover from that, but each year they blood someone new, they pick up someone from the trash heap that probably wasn't getting the attention they deserved, but they spotted some potential. Paul Alamotti this year is a great example of that. They turn them into genuine superstars. They slot them into this Penrith system and away they go. And it's going to be really interesting next year. Yes, they're losing some more massive names. Jerome Luai, James Fisher-Harris, Sunia Taruva in particular. And while I don't think it's likely that they win it purely due to some more stacked teams being in the comp next year, Storm in particular picking up Stefano uta Ukamanu will be a great get. But what's to say that with Cleary... Edwards, Yo, Martin, Brian To'o, Moses Leota and co all still there that they can't go five on the trot. For me, I think you're foolish if you doubt this team with Ivan at the helm and you best believe there'll be a top four side and still sniffing right round grand final time. They've got the Iceman, Nathan Cleary and so many quality players as well. Blaze Talangi, great pickup. Isaiah Papali'i, a handy addition too. So shit, the run might not quite be over for Pierre with just yet but onto the game itself I thought it was a bloody good game a low scoring affair which I think a lot of casual fans didn't enjoy and I've seen a few people say that it was a bore fest but for me this was exactly the opposite it was a heck of a battle the only two sides in the comp that could have gone with each other set for set like they did and it made for a gripping 80 minutes the first 40 minutes in particular shit was that intense I reckon it had that state of origin intensity about it from the opening whistle Last week, I said the key for the Panthers to get the win would be to dominate the middle and slow Melbourne's ruck speed while using their typical game plan of getting their outside backs to carry multiple times per set to limit the fatigue on the Penrith pack and that is exactly what they did. Also said Munster might have poked the wrong bear in Liam Martin and shit did those predictions prove to come true. I thought the Panthers played them perfectly through the middle, peppered the Storm pack all game, the amount of fatigue they put into that Storm side in that first half in particular and the opening 20 to 30 minutes was crazy. They looked out on their feet in the first half. I've never seen a Bellamy coach side look so gassed. They dragged them into a wrestle and choked them out. Storm's pack was dead and that stopped their spine on the spot. Harry Grant, bless him, shit did he do his best to inject some momentum, try get creative around the ruck, little scoot, scored a nice try. But when your four pack is getting dominated, you don't have a roll on. It's so hard to take advantage of opportunities around the ruck because simply put there aren't any and many people are saying Hughes had a quiet day so did Pappy well that's off the back of the Penrith pack executing their game plan perfectly on the other side of the ball some massive standouts here for the Panthers I thought Nathan Cleary was great as we've come to expect big games he goes to another level he's won 17 of his 22 career finals games the Panthers they've now won 12 straight finals games as a team as well his shoulder did didn't worry him until the end of the game. Ran the footy more than I've seen. He actually led the game for total runs. 29 runs for 212 metres. What a player. So tough. Ice in his brains and his veins. Had a try assist, a line break assist. Broke five tackles. Made 23 tackles with a fuck shoulder. Kicked for 475 metres. 
One from three off the rubber, trying to send the stead in through the sticks, which is rare for him. They weren't easy nudges, though, but not his best night with the boot. Overall, though, a massive knock, and he has to be right up there in terms of immortality already at 26 years old to have four rings, five straight grand finals to have won Clives, achieved pretty much everything you can in the game except for a famous maybe game three win at Suncorp at the origin level. Come home to the Waz, son. We would love to have you. Bring your old boy with you. Let's reunite the Clary family. There were some rumours that they bought a house here not long ago to, to put Jed in while he's here for his three years. Surely the rest of the family come across and help lead us to greatness too. Our first ever premiership. That would be the final string in his bow for me. But a massive night for Nathan. Good to see his Miss O'Mary Fowler supporting from a distance in her Panthers kit as well. I thought Isaiah Yo was outstanding through the middle. Must have been second for the Clive Churchill surely. Ran for the most metres of any lock in grand final history. 233 off 24 carries. Got through 46 tackles another 80 minute shift and any time they just lack direction or look like they were losing their way a little bit you give the ball to Yo he'll just truck it his ball running so underrated then he can play out the back he really is that fifth member of their spine he's key to them what a skipper as well and the fact he's going to be there for the next few years the most cap panther ever that leaves them in good stead to chase a five peat for sure I thought the Panthers back three all stood up massively as well all three ran for over 200 metres despite Brian To'o leaving the game 20 minutes early which is fucking crazy. They combined for 75 carries together for 661 run metres that is massive and when you compare that with the Storms back three 55 combined carries for 545 metres and while the metres there isn't a massive difference when you combine them that's 20 less carries that the Panthers pack had to take compared to the Storm which I think you could clearly see on the body language and the fatigue levels of the Melbourne pack. I also thought Tango and Alamotti were really impressive too. Tango's defensive improvement throughout this final series was massive. I feel like throughout the regular season there, he was the player that other teams were targeting to try and get results on. He was dishing up maybe six to seven missed tackles per game. Well, this one, 37 tackles for just the one miss, showed up on the biggest stage. Ivan clearly trusted him and he got the job done. Then you throw in Alamotti a nice try he's only 20 years old great try assist for that Taruva media as well which SJ broke down so perfectly on his podcast but he was a heck of a pickup for the doggies and man you have to think he's got a massive future at the riff as well I thought Jerome Luai was incredibly dangerous his ability to bounce around off that left foot and beat defenders when it looks like the play is done so often he looks tackled but he just finds a way to break out his kicking game is underrated too and for me, yes, he's been the villain over the last couple years, but I think this year in particular, he's kind of scaled it back and become a lot more lovable to the casual fan. So many still hate him, but I think people can't deny now how bloody good he is. And this was a massive year for him. With Cleary absent for so much of the season, he played seven, Snyder six, and still the Panthers were able to walk away with a premiership at the end of it all. I'm semi-gutted to see him go to the Tigers because I love that bromance between him and Brian To'o, those two, the last of that Penrith Big Four from Mount Drua with old Spencer Lenu and Stephen Crichton, but it is what it is, it's a massive get for the Tigers as well, and I saw he said he was excited at the opportunity to run a cutter and command a team around the paddock, so well done to Jerome, another great performance from him, and then last but certainly not least, in terms of your standouts for the Panthers for me, Liam Martin, aka the bodyguard, what a shift from him. 48 tackles, a try. I think he got an unofficial try assist as well. Of course, Cam Munster, I said he might have poked the wrong bear. He certainly did here. This bloke was everywhere. He's paying 34 bucks at the TAB to pick up the Clive as well. So he saluted for the punters that jumped on. I said before he set up a try too, catching that kick and then the offload for the Alamotti meeting. And shout out to Moses Leota for being in that position there too. Liam Martin, he just wanted 
wanted that kick take more than Xavier Coates. He didn't help leap him. You could just tell he was more determined because there's no way the giraffe should get done. But Martin comes down with the pill. Who's there to catch his offload? But the prop, Moses Leota, has no right in being there. That's pure work ethic and determination. Leota sums it up perfectly, realises he won't have the speed to get to the line. So he shifts it to the right and in goes Alamotti in the corner. That's just smart footy and shows his work rate and desire to put himself in the right position. But back to Liam Martin, saw an article come out post-game on him saying he's been carrying a shoulder injury since round four this year and he's been getting pain-killing injections every week just to get through. That is crazy shit. What, 25-odd weeks of injections? That's an absolute workhorse. You throw in Origin 2, you couldn't tell he was carrying that injury at all. Then he also couldn't train in the lead-up to the final with a rib cartilage injury, which if you've ever suffered one of those in a contact sport, they can be sore as shit whether you're tackling or you're carrying the ball. There's literally no way to hide your ribs, so that is huge. The bro is literally just built differently, and his kick chase was a massive factor in the reason why the Panthers won this game too. Every time the Storm Wingers came down with the ball, the bodyguard was just there waiting to fold them. It killed their momentum on site. A massive performance from him, and well done to him. A huge year as well for Liam Martin, you'd have to say behind Angus Crichton and Ali Katoa. He's right there as your best second rowers in the competition. This game certainly wasn't without controversy though. Jack Howarth, that try, for me, I've watched it multiple times and I do have to say, I think it's pretty 50-50. I've seen a few photos that look like he scored it live watching it. I thought he was held up. Of course, it went up as no try, so I think the bunker had no choice but to stick with the on-field ruling really because for me, there wasn't 100% conclusive evidence from the angles we saw live that suggested that it was a try. I have to say, I'm enjoying seeing the Storm fans cry online about the refs and the bunker too. They're getting a small taste as to what Warriors fans go through every week. And personally, yes, that would have been a big momentum shift. I think the Howarth try would have given the Storm a real energy boost. But what's to say that Nathan Cleary doesn't come back after that and just clutch it down the stretch? I think the Panthers were clearly the better side in this game and they deserve to win it, whether the Howarth try was a try or not. Shout out to Harry Grant and Ali Katoa as well. They were the pick of the Storm lads for me. Grant, what what a skipper he is, still such a young age. Actually saw him out in a pub at Magic Round, the Brisbane version of Danny Dolans. He was on the steam with Josh Reynolds. That's quite a dangerous duo, but had a quick yarn. He's a bloody good bloke, the old wizard Harry Grant. That try he scored too in between Fisher Harris and Liam Martin. That's not easy to do, and that gave the Storm a massive energy hit to start the game. Ali Katoa just caps off a massive year for him. Dallium second rower in the team of the year. He has been exceptional. His work on attack is massive, punching holes off Hughes. I thought his offloads were exceptional and his meter eatering ability has gone up a real notch. And then defensively, he's become a lockdown defender, so well done to him. Unfortunate he's playing for Tonga, not the Kiwis, and unfortunate, of course, that the Waz couldn't get him to this level. But I think this just shows the amount of development he's added to his game. I thought Munster didn't stop trying. He was willing to roll the dice. He's so competitive, he's never going to give up on a play. Hughes really really quiet like I said but due to that forward pack domination overall best team won this contest and I think they did it regardless of the scoreline fairly comfortably and the fact they could hold the Melbourne Storm a team with so many attacking weapons and that deadly quad in the spine to only six points that is off its head. So well done to the Panthers. Full credit to the Storm. They were probably the best team all year. They just couldn't get it done on the biggest stage. In the biggest games though, the cream rises to the top. And that is exactly what we saw. How bloody good from the riff. Then the NRLW Grand Final. A quick shout out to the Chooks as well who got the dub. Up 24-0 at half time over the Sharks. I thought this one was dead and buried. But the Sharkies, they had other ideas. Came steaming back into the contest in the second half. To make her a bloody interesting finish. The Chooks though, they held on. Scored late to get the dub. 32 points to 28. A good watch. And then also, well done to I think it's the Titans feeder side who bet the Jets 
hopes in that Queensland Cup versus New South Wales Cup playoff there to see who's the best reserve grade team in the competition. No doubt the Jets absolutely tuck still from celebrating their win in New South Wales. I think the Queensland team for the first time in ages actually put a weak gap between their finals and this game. So they got a mini bye week to run off the hangovers and I think that proved to be the difference. But another hissing year of NRL action in the books. The Panthers get the job done yet again but you best believe November 1 she's going to roll around bloody quick. The Mighty Wars will be back out there on the training paddock pounding the pavement heading to Bethel's to run the Dunes. Fisher Harris on ways probably close Christmas because he's playing for the Kiwis but that's exciting alongside Aaron Clark. Can't wait for Vegas. That'll be the next game we see of NRL on our TV screens. In the meantime though, international code to tuck our teeth into with Tonga kicking us off next week against the Ruse at Suncorp. How good is rugby league? The greatest game of all and another hissing season. Can't wait for Vegas baby. Rugby Union, the old 15-man code, of course, no All Blacks action last weekend, but due to the announcement of the All Blacks touring team and also the All Blacks 15, man, do we have some talking points to cover off in regards to the black jersey. Of course, Cammy Roygaard, the only change named in Razor's squad for the Northern Tour, and I do have to wonder if results in the Rugby Championship had gone a little differently, if we would have seen more of a roll-the-dice method here. I think if we'd bet Argentina in that first test at home and maybe picked up a win on the road against South Africa too that we might have seen a bit of a different mindset here. I think the indication, the fact that he's picked Sam Kane, TJ Perenata and gone with a really settled team suggests that he wants to go 5 from 5 on this tour and I think Razor senses that he needs that in order for this year, his first year at the helm to be deemed a success. Personally, I said last week I would have liked to see them roll the dice, bring in a Peter Luck guy for a Sam Kane, a Moni Narawa, chuck him in the mix, I think he deserves it. Then you bring in Hotham, push TJ to that All Blacks 15. At the same time though, you can't argue with Razor's logic. He's come out and said that Kane and TJ, their experience, still plays a massive part in bringing these younger boys, that next bunch, through. At the same time, I still think there's plenty of experience there, but I think the All Blacks 15 also gives Razor a great fallback, an opportunity to blood some young players, surround them with All Blacks, experience and of course they are going to be in the northern hemisphere at the same time so if needed he can draw on some of these players and I'm interested to see if there's going to be a bit of movement back and forward between the two teams. I was a little surprised to see Stephen Petafeta get the nod over a Harry Plummer. Petafeta playing his first minutes back in the competition the NPC for Taranaki in that shield win over the weekend. He is probably someone that will play a bit of time in the All Blacks 15 same as the guys like Irubin Loves and Co so watch this space. Overall though, a great All Blacks squad it always is and I think this All Blacks 15 team also shows for me just how much depth we still have in New Zealand rugby despite the perception in the public sometimes that we don't have the cattle or the quality of the cattle that we used to. This All Blacks 15 side coached by Clayton McMillan, for me she's stacked. There's 10 lads with All Blacks experience there including Shooter and Hoskins Satutu. Great to see both of them name. There's some unreal Real players in the mixer can only assume guys like Etene Nanai Satoru and Jim Tavatava Nawai ruled out due to injury, or else they would be in there too. And when you factor in guys like Braden Yosef, Lau Fakatava, Daniel Rona, the virus, Ricky Riccatelli, the DJ, there's so much talent out there that's been carving up in the MPC. Cam Miller, Sam Gilbert, the young Highlanders duo, Jacob Ratamaitavuki, Nepkins also misses out, Zan Sullivan. There's still so many qualities footballers out there we could almost chuck in a third string side as well and be extremely competitive against many of the international nations an interesting point for me and Hoskins Satutu in this All Blacks 15. There's been a lot of chat that he could be off to England in the near future. Of course, he's eligible to represent the Red Roses next year due to his mum having some English heritage, so he can get a passport and slot straight in. The last time he played for the All Blacks was in 2022, which means 2025, he's literally good to go. There was a post, a story post from Akira Ioane that suggested that that is the route that Hoskins was going to go down from an attack point of view. 
I would have loved to still see a Wallace at 6, Artie at 7, Hoskins at 8 trio for the All Blacks. That would have been massive and shit would it have been hard to stop. Personally, I prefer he plays for Fiji if he is going to divert from New Zealand rugby rather than England. At the same time though, England, you're literally probably going to get four times the money and I'd be really keen to see Hoskins at 8 for England taking on the All Blacks. That battle, that matchup, Hoskins would be so fired up, real chip on shoulder to prove that he should have been in this team all along. There's plenty of chat that he'll do Super Rugby season next year for the Blues before signing in the English Premiership and making himself eligible to play for them. So watch this space. If he's a pull out from this All Blacks 15, then you'd have to think a move like that is certainly on the cards. And maybe Akira, he knows more than we do. Of course, Blues teammates can only imagine their good friends off the paddock too. So perhaps there's a bit of insight into that one. But these teams stacked. Razor, he's already said that there's going to be 10 or so from this All Blacks 15 that will link up with the All Blacks for that first game against Japan in a couple weeks as well. He's come out and said they're targeting that first game against England at Twickenham, so they're going to send some experience and key players straight there, divert Tokyo, skip Eddie Jones's lads, and go straight to Twickers. So, who are those 10? Is it a Sean Stevenson? Is it a Hoskins, which could be enough to keep him? A Moninarawa, guys like that, you'd certainly have to pen them in, Harry Plummers and co too, and like I touched on before, just really interested to see the amount of movement between these two teams, there's three halfbacks in the All Blacks, only two in the 15, so does someone drop down, does a Cammy Roygar get some minutes there before taking on your Islands and co, it's going to be an interesting watch to see the dynamic between these two teams, great problems to have though, and I'd love nothing more than for the All Blacks to go north, pull off the clean sweep, five from five, and the All Blacks 15, pump Munster and Georgia too. That would be massive. On to some more news before we tuck into the NPC as well. Your final piece, James O'Connor signed to the Crusaders. The poor man's Justin Bieber and I really don't get this one to be honest. And I've been a big James O'Connor fan in the past. I actually met him once back in the peak of his powers. It was when we hosted the World Cup. Met him at the gym. Great bloke. Asked him for a photo. He obliged. Absolute roost. So it's nothing personal but I just think it at 34 years old, surely there's some young talent in New Zealand and in that Canterbury and Crusaders region in particular that would have been keen to take up this opportunity. Even so, some established talent that aren't getting opportunities in other franchises that would also jump at the chance to wear the red and black and play for the most successful franchise in Super Rugby history. The Blues alone, when you look at them, Bodie Barrett, Harry Plummer, Stephen Perifetta, Zahn Sullivan. That is four players that are all trying to fit into three spots. Surely one of them is going to miss out each week. Stephen Petafetta, that's a really interesting one for me. You could say Plummer will play 12. AJ Lamb has been unreal there lately as well too. So the Blues, they're stacked in that 10-15 role. Maybe one of them might have liked the opportunity to move down south. Big rivals, so maybe not as well. Then you look around some of the other franchises. A McClutchy, who I don't think has signed to a Super Rugby side last time I checked. He's been handy for Hawks Bay for many years now. Spent some time at Moana and I think at the Canes but never really given a big opportunity at this level. Then you've got a D'Angelo Leilua who's also signed with Moana but has been going great guns for Waikato. You've got Lucas Cashmore who's a young talent for the Bay of Plenty who's been going well whenever the Trask is out. Josh Jacob who of course made the All Blacks 15 and to me he looks like a real star 10 of the future. That performance he put in in the Shield Challenge game, so calm, collected under pressure, runs a great cutter got a good running and distribution and kicking game, literally he ticks all the boxes but with DMAC at 10 Shooter at 15 he's just going to be stuck to coming off the Remu unless they mix up that dynamic at the Chiefs there, so I thought there would have been other options, even bringing in a young buck like that Nelson College first 5, Inch I think his name is, he looks to be the real deal, do you sign someone like that, bring them through, give them the opportunity to go into a professional
professional environment straight away and not burn a contract on James O'Connor. I'm sure the Crusaders know what they're doing. They've used international players before to great effect. Pablo Matera, probably the most successful one. You'd have to say Lee Halfpenny on paper was a great signature too. Unfortunately dropped out with injury. Digby Ioane, I think he did a stint for the Cruisers at some stage as well. But this really did shock me in a position where I thought we still had some local players that could fill that void. James O'Connor at 34 years old, off the back of playing some club rugby in Queensland. Not sure that that's a massive needle mover for me. Of course, they are purely probably just buying time until Richie Mwanga comes back, hopefully in 2026, in order to establish himself before the 27 World Cup. And then on to the MPC, jump into those results from last week and tuck into some quarterfinals footy as well, which I'm really excited for. Otago, the Golden Oak, rolled up north and bet the Tanifa 31 points to 28. It was a big win for Otago, which kept their slim playoff hopes alive but unfortunately for the lads from Dunners the rest of the results didn't do them any favour Counties they beat a spirited Manawa 2 side 45 points to 26 to clip their ticket into finals football Manawa 2 off to a nice early lead and as a Harbour fan I was really excited about that but in the end Counties too classy, Cami Roygaard a double meaty, love to see that, that right there is the testament and a sign of a quality footballer, out with a long term knee injury, just comes back moving like he hasn't missed a day, his game awareness, his running game, looks like he's added some speed to his pass and his service, he's bulked up a bit up top, added a bit of muscle and then just the way his lower limbs were moving, it's so hard to do that off the back of injury, I think that's a testament to how hard he's worked in his rehab and also also, how young he is, his ability to bounce back from major injuries, certainly a lot of that comes down to age, but well done to Royds, two meaties off the Remo, a massive return from him, good to see Dalton Papali'i running a muck too, also coming back from injury, you chuck him in with Hoskins, and that's a deadly trio there, then Harbour, Shit the bed, and man was this a tough watch, 59 points to 35 she finished at Josh Becua Stadium, but at half time, this was all over Red Rover, 47 points to 7, the boys from Albany got absolutely dusted, it was heartbreak for us, literally our finals chance was in our own hands, so to dish up a performance like this, our worst one of the year, on the biggest game of the year, incredibly disappointing, we went in as heavy favourite, South they were struggling down the bottom of the ladder in second to last but man they played like a team possessed and you could tell they were up for it of course a special milestone for one of the great stags and Josh Beckuis they renamed the place after him and maybe that grew them an extra leg a third leg you could say shout out to Rambo but man were they impressive fella Toy Penny mentioned him at the start of the year as a player to look out for I thought he was great in the 12 jersey he's been the best player in Auckland club rugby for the last three or four years was meant to come to Harbour this year, which is a bit ironic. He was actually going to play for the Mighty Code at some stage. Would have been good to have him outside me in the 12 jersey, but that didn't work out. Found himself down south, and man, did he run a mark. A great performance from the Stags. Certainly deserved winners on the day. Disappointing from Harbour, though. That defence has proved to be a leaky sieve all year, and that pack just once again do dominated. Starved that Harbour star-studded backline of any pill, and they just couldn't get themselves in the game until it was too late so bloody tough scenes there Wellington pumped Hawks Bay all day 46 points to 28 Canterbury big statement performance from them off the back of getting humped by Harbour 36 points to 19 a win over Waikato to right their wrongs at home Auckland unfortunately went down to Bay of Plenty 24-26 I say unfortunately I mean that sarcastically screw Auckland still not over the Battle of the Bridge and go the mighty Bay of Plenty they're fast becoming one of my favourite second or third teams and then Tasman in the big result from the weekend unfortunately lose the shield at the final hurdle going down to Taranaki the visitors 42 points points to 29 to put the shield back on the road she's going to Bulls territory and well done to them as well and I do have to say the circumstances around this one made things pretty tough for the home side Tasman six positional switches two changes to their lineup no Tava Tava Nawai missing a few key bodies off the back of this being their third game in eight days storm week last round of the season literally the worst time to have it add to that shield holders two defenses in the space of what 
four days. That right there is brutal. Then you add to that Taranaki coming in off the back of a game against the Turbos where they rested eight of their star players. It was literally a recipe for disaster. Taranaki at the same time, though, take nothing away from them. They were unreal. Their forward pack, full of talent. They get about their work, bloody hard workers as well. And then that back line led around the field by Josh Jacob, but then also with players like Rona, Kini Naholo, Jacob Ratamata, Vuki Nepkins. There's so much razzle-dazzle in that back line, and they certainly were the better team on the day. Give Tasman credit. They didn't roll over at one stage there. It looked like the game was dead and buried. 23 points to 8 at half time. They were getting put to the sword. They had a nice little 10-minute flurry there, which made the game incredibly interesting. They brought it back to a 6-point deficit with 10 minutes to go, but Lennox dotted down late to secure Taranaki the dub. Well done to the Naki. Always say, great for the NPC when the Ramfurly Shield is on the road. Their fan showed out at the airport. That right there sums up what NPC code is all about. So they get to lock it up for the summer. Unfortunate scenes for Tasman. But they've still got plenty to play for finals footy this week. So they will be revved up to make amends. On to the finals we go. Wellington taking on Counties Monaco in your Friday night spectacle. The home side looking to bounce back and they will be stinging after being put to the sword against Counties just a couple weeks ago. Counties put 50 on them at home in that Jonah Lomu Memorial game where they rolled out that hissing Counties jersey. So well, they'll be stinging. Will they have Ruben Love, Billy Proctor and co to really bolster them? That'll be an interesting watch. You'd have to assume Roy Gard, Dalton will play as well for some more minutes. So this is a bit Big matchup, and while counties won't have Itene Nanai Satoru due to injury, it looks like at the same time they didn't have him last time and they still got the chocolates. So that I reckon will be a lot closer than the odds suggest. Counties given no chance by the bookies there. Super Saturday, Bay of Plenty up against Hawks Bay all day. The first battle of the Bay all year. So it's not just to see who goes through to the semis, but also which province gets to call themselves the Bay, which you could argue is bigger to some people. Looking forward to this game in Tauranga. Hopefully sun's out Saturday, Arvo. 2.05 kickoff, you can't beat that. They'll get a good crowd. The locals will be up and about. Bay of Plenty for me. They're a bloody quality football side. Kurt Eklund, Akoi, Amoni Narawa, stacked with talent. Lots of players in that All Blacks 15 too. Hawks Bay, ever since they lost the Shield, they've been bloody disappointing at Cricket scores put on them, got a late win against Auckland, then got dished up by Wally last week. I reckon the bop get the job done here and advance on through. Taranaki up against Waikato for me. Taranaki still too strong. Waikato, if they get back, old mate Aaron Cruden, then that will be a big improvement for them. But I was really disappointed in what they dished up last week. Taranaki going from strength to strength. Depends how dusty they are after winning the Shield. And if Luke Jacobson plays for Waikato alongside Sam a penny female then that will really bolster their forward pack but I'd like to think the yellow and blacks too strong there and then Tasman taking on Canterbury in the battle of the Crusaders region Tassie they'll be stinging Canterbury they'll be up for it and feeling pretty confident after a comprehensive win last week as underdogs at home too of course this one goes down at Lansdowne Park in Blenheim and I expect that to be another bums on seats games with plenty of local fans packing her out 205 kickoff on a Sunday Arvo Dusty on the couch after a huge night on the Darren Froffiers park up and watch some Bunnings Far Cup quarterfinals write a better script than that. She's going to be all go. I'm going to tip the home sides to all get the chockies, but we'll touch more on that in your punting segment shortly. How good is the old Bunnings Far Cup? Finals footy time. Strap in. Weekly wrap time now. We'll tuck into some NBA preseason first. Unreal scene seeing LeBron and LeBron Jr. take the floor for the first time together in that Lakers kit. And yes, it's only preseason, and people will argue that Bronny Jr. shouldn't be in the NBA. My response to that is we literally see this in sport all the time. Players get picked, kids get picked because their dad was unreal and a legend of the game. The only difference here for me is that Bronny Jr.'s dad is still the man and he's still playing, which 
makes this truly crazy. I don't think we'll see a feat like this repeated in history for a bloody long time. So cool to see those two out on the floor together and good to see NBA action back on our screens. A lot of the big names playing in these preseason games as well, which writes the script for a huge season ahead. Shout out to the Breakers as well. Pushed the Utah Jazz in the first game, in particular in that first half. Made a good showing of themselves. Sam Meninga, Lopez, Parker, Jackson, Cartwright all putting in great shifts. Unfortunately, they couldn't run it back against the Sixers though, who blew them off the floor in a bit of a whitewash. Unfortunately as well, Taco, old Taco Tuesday, we trumpeted this signing, said it was a great get, but he's been ruled out of the full 10-day tour. So a great marketing exercise for the Breakers, no doubt. Got a few Instagram followers and got to leverage off the back of Taco's announcement, but he's not going to lace up for the team, and he's probably not coming back to New Zealand either. So a bit of an anticlimactic finish to that signing. Still probably worth it though, nothing gained, nothing lost, just cost us a bit of tin, but Simon the goat I'm sure he had a bit of side in the kitty for a big marketing play like this UFC Pereira huge dub for him in 307 that bloke is an absolute machine of course if he missed the main event in this dust up he took on Roundtree who is a huge human being has to have one of the biggest backs I've ever seen floating around he wore some big shots from the big fella that would have dropped 95% of fighters out there but not Potan he's as tough as they come dished up plenty of punishment himself and got the job done in the fourth as Roundtree really looked to gas out. Clearly he had that tactic of just going out there all guns blazing, swinging as hard as he could for as long as he could and trying to knock him down. This bloke though, he's an unmovable wall and I saw Izzy come out and say he hopes that Potan goes the rest of his career without a loss. I reckon part of that is so Izzy can say he was the one that dished him up the loss but at the same time you can tell there's a respect there and Pereira he truly is one of a kind. He's been carrying the UFC in plenty of cards as well. So often when it's a bit lacklustre Dana turns to his boy and says are you ready to go? So you've got to give him credit for how active he is as a champ as well. Your other big fights on the card I thought Aldo won his fight against Bautista. He got his hand raised by decision but I thought Aldo had done enough in his return to get the dub there. And then Penner took the Baltimore title off Pennington, the co-main event. That was a good biff too. Went right down to decision and I wasn't sure the challenger did enough to take it off the champ. But that's how the judges saw it. And we have a new champion in the women's Baltimore division. Looking forward to UFC 308 now. Whitaker up against Hamza and Toporia up against Holloway as your co-mains. That is going to be a massive card. 27th of October, I think that one goes down. There'll be some lucrative opportunities on the punt there too. But the UFC continually delivering for its fans. America's Cup, that gets underway this weekend as well. Sunday, I think, 1am. So late Saturday night, early doors Sunday morning. Whatever your mindset is around that one. Wake up or stay up, I'll leave that up to you. But Team New Zealand is going to take on Team Britannia after they upset Jimmy Spittle. He is gone, unfortunately. I do think the Kiwis would have liked to take him on again because there is a bit of a friendly rivalry running between those two. But now we get to see who will win the biggest prize. I wish this event was in New Zealand. It's still a travesty to me that it's over in Barcelona. Don't get me wrong, if someone shouted me over there to Barca, I'd be all about it. But I feel like there was so much more hype last time. Albeit, my mate was in there in Team New Zealand on the grinder, so I was really excited around that but the viaduct the place was buzzing from woe to go everyone was getting around it Team New Zealand was the talk of the town this time in the lead up there's been fuck all build up and yes I think it'll ramp up now that the actual big races are here but at the same time it's just nowhere near as cool in my humble opinion the hype simply isn't there so hopefully everyone gets around Team New Zealand they can defend it win it and then next time we defend the bloody thing here in New Zealand so shout out Grant Dalton hopefully you're listening horse and you can get that done for us but get up team New Zealand still want us to win the America's Cup of course so fingers crossed that gets done and then Bathurst 
Sunday Arvo, around 2.30 I think it kicks off, not a massive V8 supercars fan but this is the one day on the racing calendar where I do chuck it on a TV screen, run the multi dual screen so I can still watch my footy or whatever else is going on and have one eyeball on Bathurst, she's a real race of attrition so you got to respect that, a bloody long one up that mountain, so can't wait for that Sunday Arvo too. A bit of background noise and a huge day for all your petrol heads on the tins as well. Shit does it drag out so you can get through a fair few boxes of better beer. That is for sure. NFL, some massive matchups on the cards this weekend as well as it continues to dish up some crazy results. The Chiefs and the Vikings remain your only undefeated teams in the competition. Both of them going 5-0 and and again, I'll repeat what I said last week, the Vikings certainly the bigger surprise of the two in my humble opinion some big games this week Friday Niners up against the Seahawks both teams looking to bounce back Niners struggling a little of course they don't have Christian McCaffrey they've been down on troops got tipped up by the Cardinals at the death there Kyler Murray putting on a clinic so that will be a good watch the Seahawks they've been pretty respectable this year a lot of people didn't give them a chance although they did go down to the Giants last week Seahawks at home underdogs perhaps Perhaps a bit of investment potential there, which we'll touch on shortly. you got the Bears taking on the Jaguars, Buccaneers, Saints. That'll be a doozy there. Baker Mayfield taking on the New Orleans lads. Cardinals versus Packers. That is also a great matchup. My Browns, we suck. We're taking on the Eagles. Don't like our chances there. Commanders versus Ravens. Shout out to the Commanders. I'll touch on them more in the punting segment as well. But they got another dub. They are firing on all cylinders at the moment. Lions versus Cowboys. Cowboys fresh off deck, clutching it for them to beat the Steelers last weekend. That was a big result for them. Detroit, of course, I've got them in multiple bets as well to go the big lift in the NFC. So I Hopefully they can start racking up some wins. Just the one loss from the four games this year. So it certainly hasn't been a disgraceful start. And then your big game on the Tuesday is the Bills taking on the Jets with the Jets fresh off sacking their coach in Salah. Now this is going to be really interesting. There's been a lot of chat over the years that Aaron Rodgers is bloody hard to work with as a coach. And many haters are saying now that this certainly proves it 100%. So is this going to be a kick in the butt for the Jets to right the wrongs of their slow start to the season will this iron out some creases and get them back into the winner's circle they currently have a 40% win rate two wins three losses many people expected them to be a lot better than this with the roster that they have assembled in the AFC so is this the turning point for their season or will the Bills pile on more hurt it's in New York as well so you'd have to think that favours the Jets but so often in professional sport when a coach gets sacked that can go either the way for the team on the receiving end so interesting to see how they go as a result from that so plenty of sporting action to tuck the teeth into this weekend we might not have NRL we might not have the All Blacks but there's still so many boxes to tick sports to watch and investment opportunities which we'll rip into now on your punting segment heck of a segue right there Right, time to have a cheeky little Carmichael punter course the NRL she's done now, but that means we get to welcome in the Pacific Championships next Friday. Can't wait for that. Aussie versus Tonga at Suncorp Stadium. That is going to be a heck of a game, but for now, for this weekend, we're forced to dive into some NFL, some Premier League. Of course, we'll go in deep on the NPC as well to look for multi-legs and continue that ever-ongoing search for green ticks on bet slips. Friday night, quarterfinal number one can't wait for these games Wellington up against counties Welly a shot at redemption of course these two teams played each other only two weeks ago with counties pulling off a huge upset and putting 50 on the top finishing side in the comp surely this weekend things change you'd have to think maybe Ruben Love Billy Proctor and co all in the saddle for Wellington Wellington dollar 35 home favorites counties paying three dollars head to head the line is seven and a half the best backed winning margin is Wellington 13 plus at $2.40 as well. To be fair, I think counties, they're a better shot than the odds suggest, but I do expect Wellington to be too good. I think the safer option here is to take that head-to-head at $1.35. Minus 7.5, quite appealing at $1.82 as well for your try scorers. Riley Higgins, he loves a meaty, just been named in that All Blacks 15 as well, so I'm going to get on board with him. Super Saturday, and this is where I think we start to 
eke out some juice. Bay of Plenty, $1.30 favourites up against Hawks Bay, paying $3.20. The line is 8.5. The best backed margin is Bay of Plenty, 13 plus at $2.25. And I like Bay of Plenty here. These two sides, they didn't play each other throughout the year. Fourth versus fifth, but I think Hawks Bay are a bit of a false fifth. So I'm going to jump on the home side, the bot, to get the chockies. My try scorer is Curdy Eklund. He scored three in his last four games. Leroy Carter on the sting. The sevens flyer just signed with the Chiefs as well for Super Rugby. He scored two in his last three. So multi those two up for a nice little same game. Remember, missed by one on a three leg same game multi. You'll get your money back in bonus cash up to 50 bucks. Bop into Eklund and Carter and ride that bad boy home. Taranaki versus Waikato, loving the Naki here at $1.40. Waikato on the road, $2.70 underdogs. And I think the yellow and blacks should be too good. They looked so sharp last week. They just won the shield. I'm not expecting them to have a big hangover. Stephen Petafeta, a.k.a. Please Add Feta, he is back. And this is just a stacked team all across the park. I think they'll look to do the job at home. The line is six and a half and I think they cover that as well at a dollar eighty two for your try scorers. Rona, the virus, Daniel Rona, he scored a double last week, I like him, Ratamatavuki Nepkins, he'll be stinging off the back of that All Blacks 15 snub, and he scored in each of his last two games, Ricky Riccatelli, he loves a rolling mall bet, the old DJ, Ricky Ricky, he's the second leading try scorer in the comp behind the great K Banks, and then I like Naholo as well, he's always a good shot, third leading try scorer in the comp on seven for the season, so plenty of options there for the home side to treat yourself on a same gamer and then the final game of your NPC quarters Tasman taking on Canterbury the old battle of the Crusaders franchise and I like Tasman here they're $1.33 favourites up against Canterbury who are $3.10 I do think it could be tight though that 1-12 to at $2.70 is looking juicy Canterbury they got a few All Blacks back Tasman down a couple soldiers as well for your try scorers Jack Gray old Grey's Anatomy he scored in three straight games Talmoy Falau he's a weapon of a finisher too, surely they shift him back to the sting, and old McDonald Springer on the wing for the Cruisers, Dallas McLeod's daughters he scored 4 tries in his last 3 games, and then George Bell, the assembly, he loves himself a meaty from close range as well so for your NPC, finals multi safe, up the guts and going the home side special, all 4 home teams to win, head to head at $3.03 for something slightly more Larry, go welly head to head, bot minus 8 and a half, Tasman head to head and Taranaki minus six and a half that'll get you five dollars and seventy five rugby union cents of course, missed by one, you'll get your money back as a bonus bet due to that oval ball mega multi buster promo and then if you want to chuck the kitchen sink at it, play some real fuck it footy for your quarter finals in the old Bunnings Far Cup and have a fair dinkum red hot crack, go Riley Higgins Kurt Eklund, the DJ Ricky Riccatelli and Jack Gray, all as any time try Try scorers, multi that up once the teams are announced and odds are out. And you should find yourself having a huge weekend on the Carmichael punt if those bad boys salute. Over to the NFL, we're going to toss the pigskin here. And I've picked out a couple games that I really like as investment opportunities. The first one, the Falcons to cover the minus six and a half spread up against the Panthers. The Falcons, they're coming in off a mini buy last Thursday. They played in London, so they get the benefit of the longer turnaround. They've also won back-to-back -back games. That last game, Kirk Cousins, he set a franchise record for 509 total passing yards along with four touchdowns against the Buccaneers team, which had allowed just one passing touchdown on average throughout the year prior to that game. So clearly, he's throwing darts and breaking hearts at the moment. He now gets to take on a Panthers team, which has allowed the most passing TDs in the NFL. That right there is the recipe for a cricket score. So Falcon Minus six at a dollar ninety. Yes, please. Then on the other side of the ledger, the Commanders taking on the Ravens. The Commanders come in with a plus six and a half start, and you can tease this out to a plus ten and a half, and still get around dollar fifty odds. I think, and this is dangerous because the Ravens at home they are a weapons. But only the Vikings and the Chiefs, the two undefeated sides, have longer 
winning streaks in the comp than the Commanders. Four straight victories for them. They've covered in each of those four against the line as well. Their last two victories have come by at least 21 points in the Commanders. They rank second in the league for points per game with 31. So that suggests... Surely they can make a contest of this one. Push the Ravens down to the wire. Plus six and a half is a dollar ninety. Plus ten and a half is a dollar fifty. For some straight up head to heads, I like the Eagles over my Browns. Unfortunately, we suck shit at a dollar twenty two. Bills over the Jets. Jets just fired their coach, of course, and so maybe they come out motivated. You could get an Aaron Rodgers looking to prove a point, but Buffalo at a dollar seventy has caught my eye there. And then I like the Texans over the Pats. A dollar thirty five head to head. That slim pickings, but the line of minus seven is also really appealing. The Patriots they've struggled to score points this year. They do give Drake May their first start, so perhaps you monitor that one with caution. But I like the Texans here. Dollar thirty-five head to head and a dollar ninety-four for that minus seven for your NFL action for your Premier League. Just some straight up head to head results I'm tipping out here. Spurs to beat West Ham at a dollar fifty. Newcastle, they should beat Brighton for me at two dollars in a close contest. Don't mind the draw there. United, unfortunately, I think they'll beat Brentford at a dollar sixty. Man shitty, they'll beat Wolves for sure. Dollar thirty. Good options for some goal scorers there. And then hopefully. The pool will beat Chelsea up yours, friend of the show, Kieran Menzies, who supports that loser team in blue. You'll never walk alone. A dollar sixty-five. Please get the job done, lads, to remain at the top of the Premier League ladder. America's Cup. How good we can have a punt on this too. Don't say the TAB, they don't tick every single box. Team New Zealand to win it outright, dollar fifty. Team Britannia, two dollars and forty cents. You can bet on each individual race too if you're really bloody keen but I'm just going to go outright a real keep the cup bet New Zealand dollar fifty. the boys get the chockies thank you very much Bathurst not going to pretend to be an expert here I'm far from a petrol head don't mind my Formula 1 but Bathurst every year I sit down on the couch delete a few better bears and get amongst it but I can't say I watch every single race in the old V8 supercars your favourites though Brown and Pie $4.50 Feeney and Win Cup I'm going to be riding them home at 5 and then Moster and Holdsworth. They're your third best action at $5.50. Some great chances there. Good odds to come away with a winner if you do know your stuff there. And then my bet of the week to round us out for your punting chat. It hit last week. 21 from 28 on these bad boys now. Backed in the Panthers. That was easy money. This week, Taranaki into Bop. Paying a dollar eighty-two. I think she's going to be a successful weekend for the home sides. I pick those two because I think they're the most clear of your winners from those contests. So let's see how that goes in the old Bunnings Far Cup. Twenty-one from twenty-eight. Not good at maths, but I reckon that's a pretty bloody good percentage to see through the NRL season. Then we chuck it all on the Kiwis at the end and hope Stacey Jones's lads can go the big lift. How bloody good! Right, Q&A time, and of course, apologies for the last couple of weeks. There's been a fair bit on moving into the new studio and whatnot. I've been forgetting to chuck up the question stories, but now we're back on. Chance to tuck the teeth into them. So chucked up the story yesterday morning, and the questions flooded through, which is great to see. First one, who is the most unlucky New Zealand rugby player not to be picked in either team? And that comes through from running for Sal. Covered it a little bit, but I'll dive a little bit deeper into this one now. Ricky Riccatelli for me, he stands out as the overall player most unlucky to not be in the All Blacks or the All Blacks 15. He's the second highest try scorer in the MPC so far this year, only behind the great K Banks. I think for the Blues as well, he's been incredible. He's had a great few Super Rugby seasons. He's so strong at set piece time off the back of lineouts. Loves a rolling mall meaty. I think he scored four tries against my great North Harbour as well. So I think Ricky he certainly has the body of work. And the CV, that suggests he should be in the mixer. At the same time, it appears they're prioritising youth over someone like a Ricky Riccatelli, but that is a pretty tough call. Braden Yossi, I thought he was massive for the Canes this year. And while he's had a pretty disrupted NPC due to injury, I think he missed the first few weeks for the Turbos. But I still think there's so much potential in him. And he's a player that I could see wear a black jersey in the future. He's big, he's powerful, he's strong, he's an enforcer, he's so athletic. So I surprised 
suggest to not see him in there. For Lau Whakatawa, for me, this suggests that he's just not in the mix at the moment. And I wouldn't be surprised as well. And I don't know this, but maybe he made himself ineligible, wants to play for Tonga. And if that is the case, then good on him. There's five halfbacks in this team at the moment. And for Lau is not one of them, which I think is pretty crazy considering his form for Hawks Bay this year in the NPC. He's almost carried them to victory in certain games. So those are probably the big three for me. If Nanai Satoru and Tavatava Nawai were available and they weren't selected, then they would well and truly be in there and right up the top of the pecking order. And then I was also a little surprised that a Jacob Ratamatavuki Nepkins didn't get a look in. I thought he was the standout back for the Highlanders this year, or one of anyway. And then he's been going great guns at Taranaki. Good on the wing, good at fullback. At the same time, we have so much depth in that position at the moment that I can see why, but a great question there. Your next one, Caleb Williamson says, any signings the Warriors could potentially target going into 2025? Unfortunately, there's not a lot out there that is currently without a deal for next year on the free agent market that I think we should be going for. I really like our recruitment in terms of who we've picked up this year that has been available. Aaron Clark, of course, got that early release. James Fisher-Harris, an early release as well. And I think Sam Healy is going to prove to be a really underrated signing in the year to come. In terms of talent on the market, still without a signature, RCG would have been a good little get, but whether he would have moved to New Zealand, I'm not so sure. I think 2026 is when we can really look to make a play. Leo Thompson, there was chat around him going back to Canberra, although his twin brother Tyrone joining the Knights next year, I believe, so why he would leave when his twin gets there, I'm not too sure, but he hasn't put pen to paper, I don't think, so I'll be going hard for him. There was a bit of chat around Britain Nicola, perhaps, wanting to come home in the future Dylan Brown there's always those rumours floating around but we've got a lot of players off contract at the end of 2025 plenty which I think we need to lock up as well so I'd like to see us lock up those big names within our squad first and then I think we can go hunting 26 appears to be a more lucrative off season for us which of course kicks off November 1 this year negotiations for that period so I think the club will be going hard there we should have some salary cap to spend as well, factoring in who we re-sign, guys like Dallin and that are off contract and perhaps they're on big deals at the moment so maybe they will take less, it's going to be a really interesting period that one, November 1 onwards because there are some big names from lots of clubs that will make themselves available and no doubt many of them will be looking to test the market and find themselves some big deals after being paid potentially unders over the last couple of seasons, so a great question there Caleb, not sure if I answered it fully but I do think we've done alright this year considering and then 26 this period kicking off November 1 is going to be really interesting to watch with maybe some big Kiwi names hopefully looking to come home again just rumours but would love to see that happen at the same time I reckon there's some rugby guys we could pick off too and I had someone message me saying that All Blacks 15 is where we should be hunting Moses Leo of course going across to the storm but when you look at that All Blacks 15 there's guys in there like a Duplessy Karifi a Sean Stevenson that perhaps could be lured by the draw of the bright lights in the bigger stage at the moment in terms of popularity in the NRL that would both be great gets shit would that be good to see next one comes through from Taylor who says what went wrong for Harbour and what do they need to do to be successful in 25 look key member of the furnace shit does he love his Harbour heat code and no doubt his balls were absolutely busted when Southland put a cricket score on us on the weekend it was disappointing scenes for sure I think Harbour they showed this year they can attack with the best in the comp, their backline elite, that back three, it leads literally the majority of stats going round in the competition, attacking stats for tries, line breaks, offloads, all that jazz, there's always a Cade Banks, Sofi Maka, Moses Leo, Sean Stevenson mentioned in those things, I think the things which really cost us this year were our defence, shit were we a leaky sieve, we could score a fuck ton of points but we could see a shit ton as well and it reminded me of the old Toyota Cup NRL Tsoll under 20 type of footy where we'll concede a fuck ton but we'll just try out score them and you can't beat the best teams in the comp doing that I also think there were so many games where we let them go in that last 15 to 20 minute period which just comes down to experience and then I thought our forward pack in particular set piece time rolling mall defence really wasn't up to scratch so there's a bit of recruitment to go on there probably to bolster the pack it was a pretty young team so they would have learnt a lot from this year and overall I think that experiment of bringing teams 
Ben Edmed, old Tane across from Australia, was a massive success too. So if he's not in the Wallabies next year, I'd love to see him come back as well. So a bit of a foundation laid. Disappointing to not make finals, but at the same time, when you win as few games as we do, we're pretty much just lucky to be in the mixer come the last week. What did we finish on? Three wins, seven losses from the 10 games. We had a points for and against in the positive of 26, but we ended up with 24 points due to so many four try bonus points and also losing within seven. So that kind of sums her up there. You got to win those big games, take your opportunities when they present themselves. And I just think overall, we weren't good enough. While we played some exciting footy to watch, we were pretty frustrating at times too. So I think we got the results that we deserve. Your next question comes through from Flynn Johnson, who says, if you could bring one player home from the Kiwis to the Warriors, who would it be? And that is a great question. There's so many talented footballers in this Kiwis team still. Of course, Jerome Hughes, the head gear assassin, he jumps out straight away. SJ retiring, so we need to fill that void. Luke Metcalf, Tamaide Martin, great options there. I think Net in particular, Met the Jet, has real superstar potential. But if you could bring a Hughes home, then that would be massive. Straight away, we shoot back right up into title contention, which of course is where we want to be as a club. And I think it would mean a lot to him to come back and play for the Warriors as well. The one Kiwi club, we see how much he loves pulling on that Kiwis jersey, so that would be a great get. When you go into the Fords, Fisher-Harris jumps out straight away. Tick, we've done that. Wouldn't mind seeing his bash brother come across and Moses Liotta as well to represent. There's something about those two as a duo, which is just cool to see how much they love and respect each other, the way they play for each other, the way they complement each other as well. At the same time, we're not exactly short for props with Mitchie Barnett, young Dimitrik Sifakula, Zion Mai Uu, you got Marata Neokore and co who can play there as well. So I don't think we're crying out for props at the moment. Joseph Tapane would be a nice get. You could play him in that 13 position through the middle. He is a massive name as well. So those are probably the ones that jump out to me. Your big names, in particular in the forward pack, your Britain Nikara, chuck him on an edge, but we're pretty good for second rowers too, although of course you would take him any day. So I think in no order, well in an order I'd take Hughes first, absolutely. Then after that, you'd have to say it's Leota, Tapane, Britain, Nikara, in no particular order. I think either of those three would be great gets for us. If you're talking a fully healthy Kiwi squad, I'd love to see Dylan Brown come over here and play six. I think that would be really cool. Ronaldo Mulatalo would be a great grab for us on the wing as well, as would a William Warbrick. But yeah, those are probably the ones that I would go after at the moment, Flynn, mate. And I'll be keen to hear your answers too, because I know you're a passionate rugby league and Warriors fan next one from Geordie George George thoughts on the Kiwis squad not a lot of experience with injuries yeah look it's certainly not the squad Stacey would have wanted to pick first as I kind of touched on in the NRL segment but I think given the circumstances it's as good as we could pick it was interesting to see Peter Hiku in there of course ex-warrior and he's been going great guns in the Super League but I did think maybe we'd go with someone like a a young up and coming centre with plenty of potential just to chuck in that environment maybe guys like that were unavailable or playing for Pacific Island nations but that was something to factor in I was a little surprised to see Peter's name but apart from that I think Stacey's done as well as he can and no doubt when I rolled out that starting 17 earlier on in the podcast I think some people might realize that this team is actually a lot better than many people assume it was just by looking off the back of the squad I will say though compared to Aussie and Tonga you'd have to think strength on paper we are probably third but I think that Kiwis mana and just how much it means to wear the jersey will help get us across the line in some of these games. Your next question comes through from Rocky who says compare the 2011-2015 All Blacks to the Panthers of 2020 to 2024. Shit, that is a great question. And for me, as impressive as the Panthers are, between the World Cups of 2011 and 2015, the All Blacks, we only lost three times, once in 2012, once in 2014, and once prior to the World Cup in 2015. If you do your quick math, that's 89% win rate, 41 wins from 46 test matches. 
that right there is a hugely successful strike rate and that probably puts them as the best team in world sport during that period. No team has ever faced as much pressure you could argue as that All Black side did leading into that 2015 World Cup too. Literally everyone was gunning for them, they were the team to beat and they delivered away from home so it's an interesting comparison. The Panthers you have to respect it, five straight grand finals in a competition as gruelling as the NRL, of course the All Blacks they have a shorter season, they just get to bang it out, they're locked in, the NRL it drags on for so long so to be able to produce this consistency in a sport that's governed by a salary cap as well, it does make it hard to compare, I get what you're coming at in terms of success and win rates and whatnot, dynasties and things like that, but I think you've got to give each one of them credit for their own accomplishments because if the All Blacks had to fit a team under a salary cap I think the results we would see would be a whole lot different as well so I get your question there Rocky I think that All Blacks team for me regarded as probably the best team or the greatest team in world sport albeit it could be biased an 89% win rate is absolutely off its head 41 wins from 46 games but take nothing away from the Panthers what they've done and the circumstances they've been dished up with their best players being constantly plucked away from them I think you just got to sit back and admire both dynasties and just feel privileged to be alive to witness two of the great sporting teams go about their work. Next one, pick your starting All Blacks 15 starting back line if you were the coach. Okay, so here we go. We'll dip into the All Blacks 15 right now. I'll bring it up on my screen and then I'll roll out my starting side. Plenty of options available for the coaching staff at halfback. I'll probably start Finlay Christie and bring Noah Hotham on off the bench. I think Finlay's been exceptional for Tasman this year and that's actually the combination that they have been rolling with once the two have been available down the back end. I think Noah offers a little bit more of off the Remu, Finlay in arguably career best form at first 5'8", I'll go Harry Plummer with Josh Jacob off the bench but that again depends if Stephen Perifeta is available in the midfield I'll go with Quintu Paya and Dallas McLeod with AJ Lamb on the bench as cover for both the midfield and as your outside backs, then as your back three I'll be going with Sean Stevenson, Amoni Narawa and Kini Naholo but something tells me, Shay Fihaki of course fresh off being included in that all Blacks training squad, he will get the start, or you could go a money at 13 actually, late change, that is what I will do, disregard everything, Narawa carving up for Bay of Plenty at the moment, just got their player of the year in the 13 jersey, chuck in there, Fihaki and Naholo on the wings, that is a big late shift from me, so that would be my starting back line, probably just confuse the fuck out of you with that late change there, but hey, it is what it is, be interested to see if you agree with that there, it just goes to show the fact I changed late, there's so much talent in that side that you really could go either way with it, Dan Lee says who are the best golfers in the Warriors, Wade Egan he is unreal, playing off a very low handicap, his younger brother who's with the Warriors development teams as well he is even sharper, so the Egan family, incredibly good off the sticks, Dylan Walker he's low key, nice, got a big ass on him, a lot of power through the hips there and he's got a nice touch on the golf course, SJ goes good of course played with him the other week actually out at Midway and he went great guns playing a lot of golf, now he's retired too, who else goes good for the boys, I think Jacko Ford is pretty decent as is Curdy Capes a lot of those Aussie lads spend a lot of time out on the course so they're probably your picks of the bunch to be fair Josh Curran when he was at the club he went pretty good too I think Freddie Lussick plays a bit of golf as well so a lot of the boys are into it best would have to be Egan probably followed by SJ and Walks in no particular order there and then your final question and I've saved this one to last because it is an absolute doozy comes through from Nathan Stockman who says put together a Warriors 30 year anniversary team that beats the Panthers for Pete Dynasty and shit this wasn't easy to do a lot of controversial decisions here so I've gone through I've named my team and then also where I felt needed to I've chucked in some honourable mentions as well at fullback I had the great man Roger Tuivasa step RTS arguably the best fullback in the world during his Dally M run in 2018 he could do it all got the hot feet the goosies of the gods the best calves in the competition as well when he puts baby oil on those bad boys geez they shine bright like a diamond so RTS he would be at the back for me absolutely honorable mention Brent Webb 
Wade McKinnon, two of the greats. Used to love watching both of them play. You could chuck Kevin Locke in the mixer there too. On the wings, I went with Francis Malley and Manu Vatuvai. You could say Dal try scoring freak, he could be in the mix, Fusatua used to love some of his aerial finishes as well, but I went with the old school duo there, used to always love watching Henry Farfili as well, but I think Mali and Manu, Manu in particular, there's no debate there, a leading try scorer in history for the club, and I think those two wingers would really suit today's game, yardage carries, they would be bloody hard to stop, and they'd start our sets off with some great momentum in the centres, I went with Clinton Torpy and Jerome Ropar an honourable mention can go out to Nigel Vangana and Brent Tate as well. Dean Bell, you could chuck him in the mixer, but I think Clinton Torpy, he was unreal. A real jack of all trades. The bloke could do it all. He's regarded as the benchmark for the club in this position. He had size, he had speed, he had skill, and he was a key part in that Daniel Anderson era, which was so successful as well. Played for the Kiwis too, as did his centre partner in my case here in Jerome Ropati. I thought he was the all-round pack Package, formed a lethal combo with Manu Vatuvai as well. And hearing guys like Monty Beetham talk, they regard him as one of the most complete and talented players to ever wear the jersey. And the halves, no debate here. The two SJs, the Prince of Penrose and the King of Penrose, Shawnee Johnson and Stacey Jones. Shout out to James Maloney, who of course superb in 2010-2011. And he's probably the other prime contender to wear the sixth jersey. But I think if you don't have these two, in your team, you absolutely don't get rugby league and you're off your head at hooker. Tough one here, but I went with Wade Egan, the club's most capped hooker in a position where we've really struggled for longevity and consistency. I think he's developed into one of the most influential players in this team at the moment. His consistency for me puts him above the other main contender in Isaac Luke, who had his days. He's a Kiwi legend, but he wasn't quite in his full flight peak of his powers at the Warriors. So I tipped Wade just ahead of him for your props. Ruben Wickey, and yes, he didn't come back to his hometown team until he was 31, and he only played 87 games for the club, but alongside his propping partner for my team in Steve Price, those two really did help set a new culture for the club. They led us to a lot of success as well, 07, 08. Those two were a massive duo. They just edge out Adam Fenua Blake, who you could argue has had the greatest seasons of any Warriors prop in last year and this year as well. Jacob Lillyman also a great contender. Should have we had some good props, but I went with Ruben Wickey and Stephen Price, the old school duo in the second row. Ali Lautidi, one of my favourite Warriors to ever watch wear the jersey. Regarded as the Michael Jordan of Rugby League, the skills he had, the passes, the offload game, the shit he could do, I had hadn't seen on a footy paddock before he was an absolute beast seems like a great bloke as well it's a real bummer he didn't play for as long as the club as many would have hoped but he is certainly in the second rows for me your other second row to partner up with him none other than the great man Simon Mannering aka Simone 301 games most capped warrior ever five-time Warriors player of the year the Warriors MVP award is literally named after him in the Simon Mannering medal he's the ultimate team man made almost 10 thousand career tackles also played 59 games at centre he truly is an icon of the club and right on your Mount Rushmore in terms of greatest warriors ever if you don't have him one two or three then shit, I start to question your rugby league knowledge at lock. I've chucked in Tohu Harris. I think his work rate, the amount of stuff he gets through defensively, his ball skills in the middle as well. He's an incredible leader, gets through a mountain of work every single game. I dubbed him the Mount Smart Mummy because he just keeps defying the odds, showing up as his body battles through the niggles and he still puts in constant at least 8 out of 10 performances. So I've chucked him in there, won a few rings at the Storm as well. Then on the interchange, I went with Lance Hohaya the Huntley Hurricane name a player more versatile than that Kevin Campion another who just changed the attitude the professionalism the mindset at the club and while he wasn't there for a long time only two seasons his impact and significance was bloody huge led us through to that 2002 grand final as well an absolute weapon then Big Ben Benny Matalino you run straight at him you'll get folded regarded as one of the hardest hitters in the competition shoulder charge of doom before 
before the rules were changed. He was a rock of that 2011 Grand Final Four pack as well. Someone you don't want to run it straight at. I think he'd be great impact off the Rimu. And then my final player, Michael Luck, tackles McGee. This bloke, there was nothing exciting about him to watch, but he was just a workhorse. Tackled, tackled, tackled everything that moves, he was a true battler and an enforcer, tough as shit, I remember him getting staples on the sideline just to get back out there, he right there is someone that you would pick in your team every day of the week, someone you would love to play with because you just know he's always going to have your back and then at coach I had to have Ivan Cleary, if you're going to beat this Panthers team, take them on at your own game, pick the coach of that team to coach your team, Ivan up against Ivan, not sure how that works, the Panthers they can pick someone else, Gus Gould or something like that. So that would be my team there. Bloody hard exercise to do and a great question there from you, Stocky. Certainly got me thinking. No doubt that'll leave plenty of room for debate as well. Some big names left out. Oh, and Guttenbills and co as well. It's not bloody easy to do, but that's what I've come up with over the last couple of minutes. And hopefully plenty of you agree with my decisions there as well. As always, chuck the stories back up next week and we'll roll out another Q&A. Cheers to everyone for firing them through. Right, that's us for another episode of STS. As always, cheers for your ears. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you back here same time, same place next week as we gear up for the tickets to go on sale for the Surly Talk Sports Golf Day. There'll be more details about that by the time that pod rolls around. Enjoy your sporting weekend, a real smorgasbord, Bathurst, NFL, some of your more niche sporting activities to tuck the teeth into as well. If you're having a flutter at the TAB this weekend, go well. Hopefully green ticks on bet slips as always gamble responsibly if you're having a few tins make sure they're better bears get around them for supporting us catch you next thursday go well stay safe and enjoy the steam if you're revving up see you at full-time sports bar how good